it's not just the what you're eating, but why and how. And so what I mean is we get so caught up in the physical plate in front of us, but how are we eating it? Because the no, one thing that always will cause bloat, it doesn't matter what you are eating, just look at how you're eating it. Are you rushing? Are you stressed out? It's really easy to just blame the food, blame the food, but then we need to really consider how we eat. Today's episode is with Allison Maris. Allison is a nutritional therapy practitioner, author of the Paleo Gut Healing Cookbook, and blogger at foodbymars.com. In this episode, we're diving into all things gut health and bloating. I get questions all the time about how to reduce bloating, manage food intolerances, optimize digestion, and so many more related topics. So today, Allison is going to give us some practical tips and takeaways that you can start to apply right away in your everyday life to help optimize your personal gut health and digestion. So before we get into the episode, a quick reminder that my group coaching membership, the FlexFam, is currently open for enrollment. In the FlexFam, I help women lose body fat, build muscle, and most importantly, become the most confident, badass version of themselves without the constant restriction and overwhelm that are typically associated with different diet and exercise protocols. So I have a limited number of spots available and they're already filling up pretty quickly. So if you're interested in learning more about the group and joining us, just go to theflexfam.com to check it out. Oh, and enrollment only occurs twice a year. So if you're at all interested in joining, this is your chance. All right, let's get into this episode with Allison Maris. Welcome back to Metflex and Chill. This is your host, Rachel Gregory, and I'm here with Allison Maris. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I am excited to have you on. Um, Today, we're going to be diving into all things gut health. We're going to be talking about bloating. We have a lot of listener questions um, around this topic, and it's something that I'm not an expert in, in terms of gut health, and so I wanted to bring other people who are you know, more experts in this field um, and answer these questions because I get them a lot in terms of bloating and things like that. And I have my, you know, own opinions, my experience with clients and what's kind of helped remedies, things like that. Um, But I'm excited to bring you on and and kind of dive into all of that. Uh, Before we do, do you want to just share with our viewers and listeners a little bit about you? What got you into the nutrition space? Tell us your story a little bit. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, And I get these questions all the time too. I think it's just very common nuisances and sometimes it just becomes chronic. And so it just, it's very frustrating. So I'm totally with you on that. Uh, So my background, I am a nutritional therapy practitioner and I have used food as medicine, but also lifestyle and a lot of mind body sort of work that I'll definitely talk through today. Um, You know, in my own personal healing journey with Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease of the thyroid, Uh, And so gut health is everything. Uh, It's everything to everything, but especially with chronic illness and autoimmunity, it's always sort of an epicenter that that we really have to look at because so much of our immune system is located in our gut. So we really have to look there. And so, you know, along my own healing journey, um, you know, I always kind of struggled with stuff my whole life, but I normalized it. Like I think a lot of us do until we start to realize like, wait, this isn't normal to be so bloated all the time or not have regular BMs or, you know, having these different food sensitivities after I eat a certain thing, we start to figure out that, you know, A, it gets a little bit harder maybe as we get older and it's too hard to ignore. And B, we start to realize that not everyone has this situation. So we start digging into it. Um, And that was certainly the case for me uh, as things started getting crazy. I was on the birth control pill for a long time and then I came off of it and then I started losing all my hair. It was just like my body just went berserk. Yeah. So it that amongst, you know, chronic digestive issues, lots of hormonal balances. I always had PCOS and just really painful, bad periods my whole life. So I was always kind of dealing with something. And then in my mid twenties, it just went off the rails and it was very hard to keep ignoring or normalizing. And that's where my 
personal journey started. I changed my whole career to become a nutritionist. Um, I had started my food blog. So I have lots of recipes um, because I was doing my own exploration of using food as medicine. Um, and now I'm lucky that I get to support my clients, you know, whether they're struggling with gut issues, autoimmune symptoms, chronic, you know, symptoms um, to really find peace, you know, in feeding themselves and managing their symptoms and just feeling more like themselves again. So, you know, I'm happy to do that. And I've got lots of resources I'm excited to share. Awesome. I love it. Um, yeah. I mean, gut health is one of those things that it's, I feel like it's been kind of like a buzzword the past at least a year or so. It's like, oh, you need to focus on your gut, but there's, there's just so much like yeah. gut health is like this umbrella term for so many different um, so many different avenues to go down. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're cool with it, I'm excited to just dive into a few questions and I'm sure we'll kind of go down some rabbit holes yeah. um, within that. Awesome. All right. So these are some li listener questions, uh, that we're going to get started with. So the first one is how do you know what foods trigger bloating? Yeah. You know, it's so, and I'm probably going to use this, I'm probably going to overuse this word bio-individual, which just means it's so unique to you. Um, you know, I'll often get questions like, can this food do that? And it's like, could it for you? You know, a lot of times. Um, so it could be anything if you are struggling with food sensitivities. And so then bloating is part of the food sensitivity and that's occurring. So that's just something to consider that it doesn't always have to be onions and garlic and maybe the things that we immediately think like, sure, it could be some of that kind of stuff, right? Like, um, you know, anything that's a little bit more cruciferous or gas cause like gas causing <laughs> gas producing rather it sure it could be things like that or especially like raw vegetables like raw broccoli or cauliflower like those things are a little more commonly known for triggering bloating and gas and just discomfort but i just always want to invite people to consider what could be going wrong or you know happening in their own body you know, versus just, is this a food that causes bloating? Well, anything could, anything could. So, you know, for that, I would say, keep a food journal. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, just a blank journal, jot down what you ate, jot down when you got the bloating. Was it right after? Is it, is the bloating more late in the day? Cause sometimes people, you know, deal with that where it's just sort of a culmination and they just have a big bloat later in the day. Um, you know, and get a little bit more targeted with it because it's hard to kind of just go out and say, well, I'm always bloated or, or whatever. Try and see if you get a little bit more targeted in terms of um, what foods might be triggering the bloating. And then the other thing that I want to say is to think a little bit bigger. It's not always the what. This is kind of what I discuss a bit in my cookbook where I talk all about gut healing. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just the what you're eating, but why and how. And so what I mean is we get so caught up in the physical plate in front of us, but how are we eating it? Because the no, one thing that always will cause bloat, it doesn't matter what you are eating. If it's like a chicken soup that you're, <laughs> you know, yeah. just like chicken broth, let's say. And you're like, why am I so bloated? Just look at how you're eating it. Are you rushing? Are you stressed out? You know, I'll probably go down lots of rabbit holes on that alone because it's really easy to just blame the food, blame the food. But then we need mm -hmm. to really consider how we eat, especially if you're the type of person that feels like I get bloated no matter what I eat, then maybe it's not the what and maybe it's the how. Mm -hmm. So some food for thought. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, I love that. And I think that is such a big piece that, that people are kind of missing. And for me, I, I missed that for a while. It's like, if you're, you know, scrolling through your phone, if you're, you know, eating while you're standing up, if you're watching TV, like if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, if you're, you know, chugging a bunch of water while you're yes. eating, and maybe we can go down that kind of rabbit hole a little bit too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's so many different factors that, that play into it that might not be just the actual food. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I would love to love to dive into that. I think we might have might have had a question about that. Um, well, actually, before we dive into the questions, some more questions. Can yeah. we talk about maybe just diving into a little bit more of the most yeah. common things when it comes to it? Maybe not being the food, but being mm -hmm. um, some of the things I mentioned, or anything else that you've seen that people kind of commonly do or mm -hmm. don't do when they're kind of sitting down to their meals. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I do, to your point, it's like, this is also just sort of an umbrella to digestion. So if I zoom out a bit and just want to give everyone some context stuff that I know, I'm sure when you learned it too, it's just kind of, it changes the game. Um, so digestion is a North to South process and it begins in your brain. 
And I think we grow up or maybe we're just misinformed hearing that it starts in our stomach, which is wrong, or even that it starts in our mouth, which is also a little bit too late in the game. It starts in our brain. And what that means is we need to be in a parasympathetic nervous system state in order for rest and digest to be triggered. So if you ever heard of fight or flight state, that's sympathetic nervous system. And then parasympathetic is the rest and digest state. So that's where digestion happens. And it's almost like a light switch. And so if we come to a meal stressed out or perfect example, scrolling Instagram or, <laughs> you know, just completely checked, like mentally checked out and worse, stressed out, um, this is where we're already kind of setting ourselves up to not digest properly because this is the first step of the process. And we've already been like, nope, I'm actually turning you off, but I'm just going to inundate you with food and hope something sticks, you know? So <laughs> that's what I most often see is that we've just grown up in this culture of drive throughs and fast food and hurry up. You've got 30 minutes for your lunch break. If that, you know, hurry, hurry, hurry. And this is that modern you know, culture way of eating. And we don't make like just a ceremony out of it a little bit more. We don't take it as a nice time for ourselves to just enjoy our food peacefully, calmly, you know, being in just a present mindful state. So mindful eating is just a huge thing that I'm always <laughs> sort of preaching and supporting my clients with because it changed the game for me. I was stuck in a loophole of what did I eat? Did this cause it? You know, constantly just overcorrecting to death with what I ate, that it food wasn't fun anymore. It was becoming very monotonous, like, oh my God, like everything I eat is going to be a problem. And of course, there's so, of course, you, that has to be looked at, but not to the extent that you're not looking elsewhere either. And that's what I see as one of the biggest things. So scrolling, rushing, 20 minutes at lunch break all, while they're looking at their laptop, they're sort of just yeah. like working shoving and food eating, in. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, but I ate a healthy salad. And it's like, but you didn't chew. You didn't even look at the food. You didn't pay attention. If it begins in your brain, we have to use our senses. So look at the food, smell the food. Hopefully you can cook most of your food and you're touching and experiencing and you have a connection to it. Um, use your senses, chew your food. That's mm -hmm. definitely right? Like I'm sure everyone can relate to this. Do you really chew your food? Do you chew it enough? So I always like to say, try to chew it to applesauce consistency. And that will make an enormous difference on bloating because the thing that happens in this sort of domino effect of digestion is think about what happens maybe even in an assembly line. I have like the, I love Lucy chocolate scene stuck in my oh head, my you know? Gosh, yeah. <laughs> so, right. Like one little thing goes wrong and everything just piles up. That's essentially what happens when things like this, minor little things that you're overlooking go wrong in digestion, that it just piles up. So now, you know, our stomach acid in our stomach is not ready because our brain never got to signal things, you know, to the mouth. We need salivary amylase in our saliva. We need to be chewing in our, in our stomach. We need strong, you know, stomach acid, we need enough stomach acid. And all these things in every step of the process, the small intestine is going to absorb the nutrients from the food, yada, yada, yada. It, everything has key roles. And when we've already just sort of been like, ah, not this, oh, no chewing. Uh, like so many little things are taken away. Now the whole process is just half-assed, right? Like it's not happening yeah. at its full capacity. So bloat, gas, maybe undigested food, you know, coming in the toilet, you know, that you see in the toilet mm -hmm. or, you know, irregular bowel movements, so many different things that this will present as skin issues. Even sometimes this is another thing I'll get for your listeners out there who are like, ah, my digestion's pretty good, but maybe you have skin issues. So sometimes it doesn't always present exactly, you know, in the, di in the digestion mm -hmm. that's obvious to you. And maybe it's even something else where your body's unable to detox properly. And so it's now coming out of your skin. So this is such a central thing to your overall health and all the body systems that it's really worth <laughs> prioritizing. But the good news is, especially with this mindful eating and saying, hey, I'm going to put my phone away for my meal. I'm going to not chug my water at meals. I'm going to get most of my water in between meals. Um, I'm going to put down other distractions and take a deep breath, calm down and chew my food. It's harder than it sounds, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. cause it's like flexing a new muscle. We're not used to this maybe, mm -hmm. um, and building a new habit, but the more and more you can just try and come to it with these simple free things, right? This yeah. is not any kind of magic pill secret. This is just, Hey, let's just try this. 
um, it, yeah. it's so effective. So I hope that helps. Yeah. No, yeah, I love that. And I always kind of use this saying, it's typically the le- the least sexy things that go the furthest when it comes 100% to agree. <laughs> nutrition, health, fit, exercise, yeah. literally anything. Um, it's, it's typically the things that are the least sexy and like you said, free that will move the needle the furthest. And then obviously there's definitely things within that and nuances and things like that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, starting with kind of the lowest hanging fruit, which would be sitting down, getting in that parasympathetic state, Mm -hmm. you know, paying attention to those little things that do, you know, make a big difference is is probably the best place to start. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, if, okay, if you have all those ducks in a row, so to speak, then it's like, all right, if you're still having issues, then we can dive a little bit deeper. Um, so another question that someone asked, um, kind of feeding off this is how to tell normal food bloat from one that needs to be addressed. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I like what you said, you know, addressing sort of these unsexy foundational things of, Hey, I'm eating like good nutrient dense food. I've, you know, greatly reduced or eliminated processed, highly refined, lots of sugar, you know, too much caffeine, too much alcohol, right? Like just basic things that we know. It's like, let me eat a little closer to nature. Let me eat well-balanced nutrient dense food, right? We're doing that. We're trying some mindful eating. We're trying to calm down and really be aware of our nervous system state and manage our stress. Because seriously, I'll even have people, you know, who they're like, oh, I bloat after I work out. And it's like, maybe the type of working out you're doing is too stressful for your body. And so again, it's like, we're going into this like (laughs) fight or flight state, right? And so your reaction is to bloat after that. And so again, it's like paying attention to all these little things. So let's say we're doing all of that um, and we're still just struggling. Or I especially, like I brought up that like end of day bloat. You know, sometimes Mm -hmm. that's a real thing where it's like, "Mm, is that an overgrowth, you know, or is it a culmination of you eating things that that's troublesome? But even if you have food sensitivity, even if you're starting to zone in on like, I think I have food sensitivities that are causing these bloat, um, this bloating or, or other, you know, digestive dysfunction, food sensitivities are a symptom. So I like to, to kind of get at the fact that it's like, "Mm, usually there's underlying things going on. Mm -hmm. It's not always a parasite. We got to do this huge cleanse. Sometimes it is like, I'm not going to joke around. Like sometimes it is, Um, but sometimes it's digestive dysfunction. Maybe you don't have enzymes, certain enzymes that you need, or your microbiome is really imbalanced. Um, Maybe it's dysbiosis, like, like an imbalance or an overgrowth or something like that, that kind of needs to be dealt with, eradicated, brought into more balance. Uh, Maybe your stomach acid is really weak or low. Um, you know, there's lots of different things that, that really need to be addressed. Your oral health, you know, needs to be considered. Um, so, so many different things that really come into play. And so that's when you'd want to get more support from someone who will look at more of the, like what I just discussed, like more root cause foundational level to say, okay, let's go down sort of this checklist. Let's really ensure that maybe if we need to do further labs, like something I run as a GI map um, stool test, mm-hmm. if you've ever heard of that. Uh, and that's really comprehensive to tell us if we have overgrowths, candida, yeast, H. pylori, like whatever other conditions could be happening, um, or even the digestive dysfunction piece, and start to work through some more foundational things that can support you so that the bloat, which is a symptom, just starts to kind of dissipate. So it's really so many diff- so many things that, that you'd want to look at. And to your point in the beginning, it's like, it's a loaded topic. It's not just like, here's how to heal your gut in three easy steps. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, for sure. There's so many different routes to go down for sure. Um, I would love to go down each one, but I know that would be like a 24 hour podcast. Yeah. Yeah, It would be a series. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we do, maybe we can do that in the future. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I wanted to uh, ask, cause you mentioned about obviously food sensitivities and something that's common that I've seen, uh, people ask about, um, and, and actually do is take, you know, those food sensitivity tests that you see people kind of promoting or, um, even like at the doctor, sometimes they'll be like, oh, we should like take, take this food sensitivity test. Mm-hmm. Um, so can we just chat a little bit about like what is wrong with some of those and if they're even showing you like the right thing? Um, and for example, I'll just give a quick example. I have like some clients that I've worked with in the past where they'll come to me and they'll be like, yeah, I took this food sensitivity test and I'm allergic to this, 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 and this. And 
this was like red and all this yeah. stuff. But like, what does that actually mean? Is it actually accurate? Um, yeah, so, yeah, great, great topic. I love talking about this. So, yeah. cause just like you, it's like, I'll get the, you know, people, especially when they do this direct to consumer testing, like you just order it online, no practitioners helping, helping you and you just do it. Right. Or even if you do it with a doctor, but you still get no support or, or anything more. Right. So I'm not a fan of that. I think it's a really easy way to further complicate your relationship with food and your body and just now start when we reduce, when we reduce food from a food sensitivity test, right? Like we got all these results, like you're saying, red, yellow, whatever. Um, we hone in, it's just our primal brain, just like honing in on like, don't do that. That's a no, right? Like don't step on that landmine. Um, great. But now we're further reducing probably what we're eating already. We, as people just tend to lean on our favorite foods every day, right? Like the same old stuff we're eating every day. And then the unfortunate thing is when I see when you have zero support and zero direction and protocol as to how to move forward and reintroduce foods, because that is the idea. You're not supposed to just lose foods forever over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is, is that we don't have any kind of protocol to you know, say, okay, what can I eat? <laughs> um, do I need to eliminate all of these and for how long, you know, so something, you know, similar to what you're describing the red and yellow, it's like a traffic light kind of situation. Um, you know, I do that on what's called the MRT test. And I'm always just trying to build things out very methodically. Like, okay, this you reduce for six months, this you, or eliminate this, you eliminate for three months, these things you reduce and you rotate, right? There's some things that it's just like, Hey, just have them once or twice a week and rotate them. You don't have to take them out forever, you know? So you want to get to a place where you feel like you get it and you understand what your options are. Then you want to have your list of like, these are all the foods I focus on that I do eat. You know, I always give my clients as like homework. I'm like, okay, cool. Now we understand what you have to eliminate. Now, all I want you to care about is the pro list. Like here's the green list that you grocery shop with, that you request when you go to eat out, that you enjoy, you know, and, and we rotate and we use this as an experience to like open our world and try food that we didn't ever try because we're so used to the same like potatoes, rice, chicken, mm -hmm. fish, you know, just like the same stuff over and over again. Let's try some wacky vegetables you've never heard of. I don't know, some, some different protein. You, what's so funny is like people will always, <laughs> they'll freak out when they're like, oh my God, a chicken and beef, what am I going to eat? And I'm like, well, <laughs> let me tell you, there's like a million other things yeah. you can eat. <laughs> like elk, bison, you know, let's try some other stuff. So, um, you know, think if we can think of it as an expansive, positive thing, I think mindset is mm. one of the, the biggest things. And it's hard to do that alone. I think I, it's hard to kind of get this list. It's a little jarring. It's like, wait, half the stuff I eat every day. <laughs> what yeah. am I supposed to do? So it's very upsetting. So that's one piece. Uh, that's one reason why I really don't love when you do it alone. But then the other even bigger piece here is again, food sensitivities are a symptom. So mm -hmm. an elimination diet, I don't, I don't know that I'd call it a band-aid. It's not really a band-aid. It does help, but it's not healing you alone, right? I think we have it in our head, like, oh, I'll just eliminate this and everything will be great. No, you could lose more foods because you're in the propensity of, of having food sensitivities. So now whatever mm -hmm. you eat more of, you might get sensitive to that too, eventually. So we have to dig deeper again to say, why am I having these food sensitivities? Just like the same thing with the bloat. Why is this occurring? You know? And so I actually just posted about this on Instagram. If you're having what's called leaky gut intestinal permeability issues, where food is leaking out of these cracks in your intestine and it's leaking out into the bloodstream, whatever you eat a lot of is fair game to be sensitive. Yeah. That it's not because the food is bad or wrong or poison. It's just what you're eating. That's it. So that's the other imperfect thing about these food sensitivities. In general, they're not hundred percent accurate. Like they always say that, but, um, the other thing is, is like, well, what you eat a lot, you'll probably see on there quite a bit, um, just by nature of what's going on with you. So we have to heal at that root cause. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you say, when you, and, and that was actually the question I was going to ask, are there false positives where it's like, okay, I eat eggs every day and now it's showing that I'm sensitive to eggs. Is that because it's a, po a false positive? Like, are you really sensitive to eggs or is it just showing up because that's something that you eat? 
a lot. Well, no, it, it's probably true because so what's happening, especially with like leaky gut, right? If food is leaking out into your bloodstream, it doesn't belong there. So our immune system, which 70 to 80% lives in our gut is like, what the hell is that corn floating around in the bloodstream? Yeah. Because especially, okay, so especially leaky gut, when we talked about that domino effect, mm -hmm. there's lots of undigested food likely that's hitting, you know, it's like kind of hitting into the small intestine and further causing this, this permeability that's cracks. So like food is coming out in it and it shouldn't even look like that. You know, it's, it's too big. It's, it's not absorbed. Um, it, it shouldn't be what it is, but it, here we are. And so it's sort of slipping out into the bloodstream and our immune system sees that as a threat. It's saying, what is that foreign thing in the bloodstream? Go attack. Hives, bloat, digest it. Like this is where all these symptoms sort of pop up that you're, it's from your immune system, essentially. For the most part, you know, it kind of depends. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's nuances, but um, so that's what I mean when I say just by nature of what you're eating a lot, it's slipping out immune system might be having a response to that. It's not every single thing you eat every day, you know, for sure. Although I've met some people that you'd be surprised that they will react to almost everything that they eat because it's that far along. And mm -hmm. so they really need some deep healing. Um, but it doesn't have to be. And there's always going to be things like on there. I'll always like present that they're like beets. I never eat beets. And I'm like, all right, well, that's a freebie for you. Who cares? Like, <laughs> just yeah. move along then. You didn't see anything here. Um, but yeah. you know, it kind of, it kind of depends. It's not, it's not no, a perfect yeah. science. That makes sense. So this is a whole loaded question here, but obviously with leaky gut, there's so many different protocols to go down with that, but are there any like general, um, general advice or general things to focus on to help if you suspect that you do have leaky gut, for example, yeah. I, I would say in terms of recommendations that I could say widely, right? Like, cause everyone is so individual and kind of depends what's causing that for you. Mm -hmm. Um, it would be to, to be thinking about that domino effect and to really start at the brain with the mindful eating, to be eating good, whole nutrient dense foods. That's why I, I like the paleo diet, um, because it's easier to digest usually unless you're inundating yourself with nut flour products. <laughs> I always see like my paleo beeps are like, yeah, so paleo cake all the time. I was like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, just eating those nutrient dense foods and minding how you eat and doing all that stuff. Also, I mean, not to like plug my cookbook, but I'm going to plug my cookbook. I mean, I talk a Do lot it. about this. <laughs> I talk a lot about this. And so anyone with suspected or confirmed leaky gut can be doing the things that I say in there. I have two chapters in the beginning describing and going into a little bit more detail on the digestive process, like digestion 101, basically. And then I give 10 strategies, you know, tips that you can do in your everyday life that are not going to be huge or overwhelming, like the mindful eating, like different ways to prepare food, um, different ingredients you can cook with to help ease, whether it's bloating or other, you know, digestive discomfort, things like that. So you can be kind of working through that, um, I talk a lot about bone broth. I cook with a lot of bone broth. Mm -hmm. That's always going to be a recommendation of mine is like start drinking bone broth if you can tolerate it. Some people can't. Um, so, you know, different things like that when used little by little can really start to make a really big impact. Just as you said, the unsexy things yeah. um, really start to help. So it's not that you need to go out in search of super expensive protocols and all these millions and millions of supplements, um, because sometimes you can't even absorb them. <laughs> sometimes your digestion is so impaired. And so it takes some more foundational healing. Um, and those can certainly have a place and sometimes you really need them, but not without all of this happening too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. No, that, that totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. I love the way you kind of put that, um, into perspective. So cool. All right. So we have a few, we're rolling along here. We have a few more questions. Sure. So we kind of dived into this, um, or dove into this. I always don't say that word right. <laughs> um, okay. So I'll just read the question. <laughs> Favorite remedies for belly bloat. Uh, that's the first part. Yeah. And then the second part of the question is what are temporary versus long-term solutions for bloating, which we kind of already went into yeah. that. So yeah, like favorite remedies, I guess, for belly bloat. Yeah. Um, breath work. I know you were waiting for me to like come out with like a tea or something. I will come out with my tea recommendations, but <laughs> no, I, I really, I, there's something to be said when you are feeling that bloat, 
you know, just discomfort in the stomach, um, just to start belly breathing, you know, just breathe into the belly a little bit. I think that a lot of us do not do that, whether we're stuck in fight or flight, um, we're really stressed, we're anxious, our shoulders are up to our ears, you know, we're just like so busy, we're not even thinking and we're not even conscious of our breath. But I also, I was just telling um, like a group coaching call this, um, I think especially as women, for the women listeners, I feel like we've been told to constrict, to suck in our belly, to, you know, not breathe, like to not breathe right and not breathe in our belly. And so, or even just in our diaphragm, right? It doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be belly breathing. Um, but, and I find that by constricting, we move our breath up into our chest. And so we're not even connected to our stomach. So when people are like, go with your gut and breathe into your gut and it feels hard, there's a reason for that. You need to, it's a muscle. We need to like retrain, rewire, practice. So when you sense it coming or when it's there, like just start breathing and get into that safe zone again, get into that parasympathetic zone and just like calm down. Cause that alone can honestly really, really help. Okay. Or at the very least, it can help tune you in a little bit better into maybe what caused it. You know, you can kind of just take a second and pause because I think some of us get very like, Oh my God, I'm uncomfortable and I'm bloated and I don't like feel very good in my clothes and, and I'm feeling, you know, all the, all the feels and it just stresses us out further. So that's one thing I would say I always do immediately. And it helps. Um, secondly, I would say, yes, there's definitely remedies. Like I really like, um, fennel tea, peppermint tea, ginger, you know, just really nice things that you can do. Put that, you know, put a little tea together or put ginger or lemon in your water, for example, and just be sipping on that, especially if you know you're more prone to it and just going through something that will help. Um, chamomile can sometimes help too. So there's, there's really great herbs like that. I do also like to say, this is not necessarily a remedy. It's a little bit more proactive, but cooking with certain things, carminatives they're called. So like bay leaves are my favorite. Um, you know, you can cook with that, with anything like onion and garlic that might be causing gas for you. And that can help reduce get like the gas. So th that's kind of like a little proactive tip with cooking. Um, but yeah, those, I, I want to say those are my favorite, you know, staying hydrated in between meals, not chugging water at your meals. You're going to squelch your mm -hmm. stomach acid. Um, so that's, that's kind of a big thing, but yeah, those are my go-tos. Those are my favorite with the bloating. Yeah. Those are all great tips. I like the bay leaf one, bay leaf uh, proactive idea. I haven't, yeah. I, I never heard about that, but I always put obviously. it in my soups and mm -hmm. stews, especially because that's, you know, if there's onion and garlic and celery yeah. and all these things, and it usually works like a charm. Awesome. I love that. Um, this is kind of my own question mm -hmm. going off of, uh, the, what you mentioned before about, you know, at feeling like the bloat might, you know, kind of occur over the course of the day and like you get to the end of the day and you're like super bloated. Um, yeah. this is something I've, I've actually gotten this question quite a bit from, from listeners where they, they're like, why do I wake up in the morning and my stomach's flat? And then by the end of the day, I look pregnant. Like, yeah. obviously there's so many different things that that could be causing that, but can we, we talk about that a little bit more, maybe just that, yeah. like what that could be like, is it just because the foods that you're eating throughout the day, that's what's causing it. So like when you're sleeping, you're obviously in that like parasympathetic mode, mm -hmm. sleeping, resting. And then sure. when you start your day, you're just, yeah, it's like, now I have a big belly. <laughs> totally. No, that's that. And yeah, that's a great correlation to make is that like, I was rested, you know, calm, nothing bothering me. Um, and then maybe you're ahead of a stressful work day or just stressful day in general, um, cramming in food, not mindfully eating. And so it's just a buildup and culmination of that by the end day could be that could be that and, or something deeper going on. I know one of the most common things when it's just like, oh my God, no matter what I do, I'm pregnant by the end of the day is something like SIBO or CIFO. So that's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or fungal overgrowth. Um, and it's almost like you're feeding these bugs all day essentially. And it's this like bloat that you have by the end of the day, it's kind of this, um, these gases that, uh, they let out. <laughs> it's like really nasty to kind of like talk about these bugs, but <laughs> fun fact, three to four pounds of us are gut bugs. It's really special. Mm -hmm. We're like these hosts for these, you know, this bacteria. And so they can really make our, our lives miserable when they start taking over. 
Um, and so that's, you know, the whole deal with the microbiome is trying to keep things in balance. So, you know, it could, again, it could just be a culmination of the way you are eating and what you are eating and, or it could be something a little bit deeper mm -hmm. that you need to investigate. Yeah. Um, and I would say, regardless of which one or which combination it is for you, everything that we just talked about with like eating mindfully and considering, you know, just let's get some junk out of the diet. Um, let's manage stress has to be happening because I can promise you I've personally, like I've had, I've had SIBO several times and I've relapsed. Like you'll think, oh, okay, cool. I got it. I'm killing it. I went through the breath test that they do. I got the antibiotics and doing all the things. I feel a little bit better. And then like a month later, it's back. And because if we didn't address those foundational items, the stress, the not mindfully eating, what I'm eating, like whatever, if I'm not addressing the terrain that I create in my microbiome, I'm creating another perfect recipe for disaster because I'm going right yeah. back to my old habits. So that's why I love to stay in the unsexy zone for as long as we need to, because that's the work. That's the shift of lifestyle. Gut healing is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's not a one and done, like, cool, I healed my gut, I'm done. Like you heal a paper cut, like, no, I wish. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's just a constant thing. You are always eating. You're always dealing with toxins, with stress, but gut brain, you know, all these mm -hmm. different things. And so it's a maintenance, it's a lifestyle. So working on those shifts are really important. It is very enticing to say, I'm just going to do huge protocol. And, and yes, mm -hmm. that I've done, I always do them, but we have to start somewhere. We have to start those shifts sooner than later. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, we want to focus on those basics, no matter what's going on for you. Yeah, no, I love that. And as you're talking, just like, I work with a lot of uh, female clients and taking them through different body composition, um, protocols and things like that, whether it's building muscle, losing body fat, that's kind of like where I specialize in body recomposition. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's exactly like exactly what you said. Even if your goal is to lose body fat, for example, and you go on a diet or go in a fat loss phase, you, if you do that for a period of time, then you just go back to doing what you're doing before. Like you're just going to end up right back where you were. Exactly. Um, and so it's the, I think there's like a statistic, it's like 90 plus percent of people who lose weight, gain it back because they're, they're not implementing the foundational habits and like lifestyle things that they need to implement in order for it to last. Right. Yeah. Um, so exactly what you said about like, unfortunately the, the quick fixes when it comes to anything, it's usually just doesn't work. Right. It's a quick Absolutely. fix. And usually it just, you just go back to where you ended up. So, if, you know, addressing the foundation, addressing the, the underlying symptoms, as you were mentioning, mm -hmm. um, or the underlying issues that are causing those symptoms are, is usually where the, the magic happens. A hundred percent. It's, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but I always say this in my like coaching program, it's be, do, have, you same with your like weight loss and fat loss protocols is like you have to be the person that weighs this or be the person right that is at the after photo now yeah you don't wait for the after photo you don't wait to have the result to now certain start you know start being this person that loves you know eating healthy and loves working out and loves doing you have to start being that person now. Mm -hmm. And it's hard because we're waiting for the after photo in so many ways. And I'm always trying to impress upon people like it's back, that's backwards. You know, you're waiting yeah. for something that's an external temporary thing. You can make it more permanent by shifting now and doing the unsexy lifestyle work, yeah. but it's, it's the deeper needed work for sure. Mm -hmm. I love that. Be, do, have. Yeah. That's it. Love it. Awesome. Um, all right. We have a few more. I know we're getting close on time here. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. I have, all right, let's try to get maybe two more in sure. or maybe three quick ones. This, uh, this might be a, a tough one to, to dive into in, in a short time, but it says, is there a link between hormones and bloating? I am perimenopausal and the bloating seems constant. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hormones are certainly, I mean, so if you think, um, if you think about cortisol, especially, and so what's happening with menopause and even just perimenopause. So what's happening there is your ovaries are handing the baton off to your adrenals to start helping with 
some sex hormone production because now our hormone production is going down, right? Of estrogen and progesterone. Mm -hmm. And so if at the stage of perimenopause and menopause, our adrenals are burnt out, our adrenals are exhausted from a stressful life, modern day life, right? Like where our adrenals are constantly activated. Well, now it's, again, it's almost like this assembly line of like, here you go, good luck. I, I hope you can do something with this. Yeah. And our adrenals can't. And now, so all these symptoms, hot flashes, it's like out of control and it's to the nth degree, right? Um, bloating can certainly be part of it. Weight gain that's stuck, right? People are always complaining about when they, when they start to hit perimenopause and menopause is like, oh my God, I've gained like 20 pounds and nothing will budge. And it's getting worse when I restrict calories or, mm -hmm. you know, anything like that. And it's like, yeah, it's not about that. It's st other stuff. So, you know, that's certainly part of it. And in general, I like to think about adrenals too, because that's where cortisol and adrenaline is being produced. And so if you've ever heard of like cortisol belly, um, sometimes runners have this where there's just sort of this little belly that, that they have because it's this adrenaline cortisol, you know, from the stress. Mm -hmm. So that can certainly be a part of it. And just in general, right? Like as women, we know through certain times of our cycle, if it's during our period or whatever, like we're just feeling a little bloated or, or whatever it is. And it's like, yeah, in those situations, like, it's okay. It's temporary. We know some remedies now, things that we can do, you know, that will make it easier. Um, but when it is hormonal like that, it, you kind of have to, again, focus on the foundations, um, of the health with that, of your blood sugar balance, of your adrenals, of your digestion and detox. Uh, but then also maybe you need to seek out a little bit more support, someone who's a little bit more supportive for menopause too, because there's some cool things, you know, that they can do with you. Things like hormone replacement therapy. You have to be with someone who knows what they're doing though. That is like... <laughs> Yeah. It's like an accessory. That's something you do downstream. You want to do the foundational work first, or yeah. again, it's another band-aid, and it's not going to do it. Um, yeah. So yeah, but that's totally possible for sure. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Awesome. Um, so let's see. Do you have time for like two more questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So someone asked, and this is about water, and they're like opposing <laughs> questions actually. So I'll just. I'll lay them both out on you and you, you let me know what you think. Oh, yeah, so, I see that. <laughs> someone said, can you explain why water helps reduce bloating? And then someone also asked, I'm bloated after drinking water. What's up with that? <laughs> this is to prove my point about bioindividuality. Like one man's poison is another man's medicine or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Reasons why water would be helpful is because water flushes toxins and moves things throughout your body. It's water, right? It's keeping things moving. So it's going to help you pee. It's going to, you know, all the things help you have a BM, right? Like just keep things moving. So that's why it would help you to be hydrated. And you always want to be hydrated, right? For all the things. Um, in terms of why you might be bloated after drinking water, I have to assume you're chugging water probably with meals. That's what I would... I would think is causing that. Um, um, I mean, unless you're drinking like maybe tap water and there's, it's not filtered and maybe there's like things in there that are bothering you. I mean, I always drink filtered water mm -hmm. um, or, ooh, very cold water is another thing that could float you. I always drink room temperature. Again, unsexy guys. Yeah. <laughs> hey, drink room temperature water. You just listen to this podcast. That's what you got. Um, <laughs> you know, you can add a little lemon, you know, stuff like that, right? Like it's totally, I used to always love ice cold water because it was like more refreshing to me because I was like hooked on sugar and that's, what, <laughs> it was a more refreshing thing to me. Yeah. Um, but you've got, if you shift more to, to room temperature, like your body's temperature a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's much easier on the body. And so it, that will help a lot of, I mean, is I, it, I would bloat if I were chugging super cold water, probably. Is it because the cold water is like a stress to your body? It, yeah. Like, I, I've definitely okay. heard it described as that. Yeah. Like it's kind of a shock that it's so oh. cold. <laughs> um, you yeah. know, some people do, and here's, I haven't seen this question, but I feel like people could be thinking it, especially for women. <laughs> I feel like if we see a male doing these things, well, why doesn't it happen for them? Yeah. Because I know, for example, my husband drinks super ice cold water. That's all he'll drink. He'll drink it during a meal. And I've never seen him bloated ever. Like I don't, oh he doesn't, nothing he does will blow him. So it's just hilarious to me that 
for everything that I say is always like, but you're probably going to see plenty of people that don't go through this and especially our male counterparts, I feel like. Um, but everyone is just different. Everyone is just different. And if you're feeling and you're tuning into being sensitive to certain things like this, you know, these are, these are the tips and tricks, but everyone's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And is it because are females more prone to it than males because of just hormonal differences maybe a little bit more sensitivities there. that's that's usually my is that always your answer because that's always my answer is like well yeah. women have a ton more hormones than men and yeah. think about how many things our hormones are just like firing you know between all these yeah. different systems and it and yeah so that's usually my answer because I just feel like they have an easier time with everything <laughs> yeah um digestion and detox yeah. and you know all the things so that I would like to blame hormones yes <laughs> yeah yeah, I'll, I'll go with that too. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. So I guess last question I have here, what are your thoughts on activated charcoal? Oh yeah. Um, I like activated charcoal. I'm assuming they're, they might also be asking about that in relation to bloat. I don't know mm -hmm. that I, you know, it can help. Um, here's the thing with activated charcoal. So what it does, it's a binder and it binds to toxins in the body and helps to usher them out. Okay. Um, but it doesn't necessarily like it can take out medicine. It can take out supplements too. And so you want to take it away at least, at least away one hour from all your meals and, you know, supplements and medication at least an hour, um, because it can take them out. So it, it doesn't discriminate, right. It'll just like take out whatever. Yeah. Um, so I think it's good. I tend to use it if I'm like, I ate something and it is not agreeing with me. And I'm like, Oh God, like get out. Like I need, <laughs> like something's not good. I need this to get out. Um, and so you just drink it with a lot of water and, and you're good to go other times. So I always travel with it for that sake in case I'm out and eat something that didn't agree with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, you could also even use it if you drink wine and wine doesn't always agree with you. I sometimes take one with like my first sip of wine. Um, and that, that's a little hack, a little hangover hack for you. It can help. That doesn't mean go get sloshed and like drink a <laughs> bottle of wine. You're like, oh, cool. When I took activated charcoal. Uh, just, yeah. I'm talking like I have it with like one glass of wine so I can be fine. Like that's what I'm talking yeah. about. But yeah, it, it, it can be a super helpful tool, but you know, let's not overuse it again. It's no magic pills here. It's, it's not going to mm -hmm. be a magic pill. Yeah, no, for sure. I love that, that all great tips. I feel like there's so many other questions I want to ask you about so many other things. So we might have to do a part. We might have to do a part two. I'd love to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, so yeah, those are pretty much the questions that I have laid out here from the listeners. But um, And there's so many other subjects that are just in my head right now, but I'm going to hold off <laughs> and uh, respect your time. Do you want to tell our listeners or viewers just anything that you have going on, where, where they can find you, your book, social media, all that jazz? Yeah, I would love to. Um, well, look, come hang out with me on Instagram. That's one of the easiest ways. Feel free to DM me, say hi. Um, and, you know, I've got lots of content on there too. I'm always sharing, you know, me trying to do a video or a reel or whatever, <laughs> little <laughs> graphics trying to educate you guys. Um, so you can find me there. I've got tons of paleo friendly, AIP friendly recipes on my blog, foodbymars.com. Um, and I'm leaving you guys with some like gifts, some things that will help mm -hmm. uh, with digestion. So like a very easy 20 minute meal prep I have. I have a mindful eating challenge. So you can practice all the things that we talked about. Um, and then my cookbook, honestly, I think the reason that I made it because I wanted to be one of the most approachable ways to gut healing and to shifting into that gut healthy lifestyle that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So it's not a super stressful, like overbearing thing to take on. It's these little shifts that we start to make. And I'm, I'm so happy because it has been resonating with so many people feeling like, Oh, these are things I can do. And this is really helpful. And it's backing it up with some data so that everyone can understand a little bit more. So I would say if, if you're like new or super intrigued and geeking out on gut health right now, um, even if you're farther along, that's going to support you. And I've got 75 paleo and AIP friendly recipes. I've got a meal plan, all the things to just get you on your way. Love it. Yes. And I have the book as well. Yay. Um, I got it a few weeks ago, actually. Awesome. It is awesome. So I'll link, I'll link everything in the show notes uh, for everybody to check out social media, um, your book, uh, the freebies, all that jazz. Great. Um, Awesome. All right. Well, I am going to have you back. Hopefully if you'll, if you'll come I'd back for to. round two. Yeah, of course. Cool.
Awesome. All right. And if anybody's listening and they have any other questions that come up as you're listening to this podcast or um, questions that, you know, you want me to dive into next time, definitely just reach out. Um, let me know. You can add either a view on the podcast, add it in there, or, you know, reach out in, on either to either one of us, maybe on social media, yeah. and then we'll, we can dive into that in the next episode. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and I will chat with you soon. Thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning in to this episode with Allison Maris. I hope you enjoyed it and were able to take away some practical tips and tricks to help create more mindful eating behaviors and also support, you know, optimal digestion for yourself. Another quick reminder that my group coaching membership, the FlexFam is open for enrollment. If you're not seeing the results with what you're currently doing and you're just not ready to invest in one-on-one -on -one coaching maybe, this group coaching membership is definitely for you. FlexFam members get exclu exclusive access to me and my proven nutrition, exercise, and personal development protocols to help you become the most confident, badass version of yourself. So enrollment only happens twice a year. So this is your chance to get in. If you're interested, you can just go to theflexfam.com to learn more and sign up. All right, I'll see you next time.